Welcome to Feminized. It's time for a show that turns the spotlight on the powerful women shaping cannabis culture. The cannabis industry is on fire and women are sparking it up. If you like the show, please subscribe. You can also subscribe to the Feminized podcast with Liz Grell on YouTube and Instagram. The future is feminized. In this episode, I sit down with second generation cannabis cultivator from Humboldt, California, the unstoppable Miss Wendy Kornberg. Wendy is the founder of Sunabis, a legacy Humboldt female owned and operated DEM pure regenerative cannabis farm specializing in natural farming. We got to meet up last week at the Supernatural Organic Cultivators Conference in Massachusetts, and she really opened my eyes to the massive benefits of regenerative farming for cannabis. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I bring to you the physical embodiment of Mother Nature, Miss Wendy Kornberg. Hey sis. You're now listening to the Feminize Podcast. Okay, so here we are, the Supernatural Organic Cultivators Conference. How's it going? It's amazing. This is, um, being that this is our inaugural conference doing this, it's taken a lot of work up to this point and it's always questionable when you do these things like is it gonna work are people gonna get value out of this are yeah. we just you know are we just wasting our time or is this something that you know is actually relevant especially where we are because I'm from California I'm on the exact opposite side of the coast yeah. so sometimes you know what we think is important to bring over here we get over here and then people are like oh yeah that we don't really deal with those things or you know whatever the case may be and um, feedback's been amazing people are like we are so grateful for you to bring it here especially to like they're like Massachusetts nobody ever comes to Massachusetts right <laughs> I know when I heard this conference was happening here it's like oh whoa maybe I've been missing out all along maybe there have always been you know kind of a there's been an underground organic growers um, network there but no you know you you brought this methodology or at least you know your flavor of it from mm -hmm. Humboldt here to the East Coast why was that important for you to come and bring it here um, to the East Coast in Massachusetts specifically? Well, so the interesting thing about the East Coast, Massachusetts just was a kind of fluke that happened. Um, we were, our really good friend Ben lives here and he works with, you know, Korean natural farming and he d develops facilities mm -hmm. and he, we talk a lot and things. So he was just like, you know, Massachusetts would be cool. And we're like, oh, you know. And then Dan Kittredge, one of our keynote speakers is also in Massachusetts. And so it just kind of things synergistically started to work out really well. And there's a lot of farming in Massachusetts. Okay. And there's a lot of natural farming in Massachusetts. But it seems like they lack a bit of the, you know, connectivity that we get sometimes in cannabis culture on the West Coast. And that is a lot because we're allowed to talk about it. Right. It's been legal for so long that we're not hiding as much anymore. Right. And so as all of these yeah, states start emerging and coming out and having their own medical and recreational programs, we really wanted to make sure that these people are able to start paying attention to the things that we've had problems with. Right. So not allowing policy to move forward without having some really strict guidelines and how to speak out right. with those and how to even know what they are. So it just kind of all played together to be like, this is a really important message to bring to this side. Absolutely. And that was one of my, I think, biggest surprises by, you know, being here in the flesh is knowing how much of the advocacy, just how strong the advocacy piece is right alongside the regenerative farming and organic techniques and all this just amazing, mind-blowing conversation. It's about actually how to put this into practice yeah. and, and really hold on to your freedoms. Yeah. You know, is um, something that definitely resonates with me as a Texan and you know, what we're fighting over there, but um, that's very, um, that's incredible. So yeah. tell me a little bit more about, I think, um, deviating from my questions a little bit, what are the West Coast um, farmers kind of facing? What kind of challenges are they facing that you might not face on, in, on the West Coast? Straight up, it is it is oversupply. They've over they've given out too many cultivation licenses and not enough retail licenses. Oregon faces similar in that they yep. just gave out too many licenses. Period. Right. There's too many retailers. There's too much cultivation. There's too much of everything. And Oregon is a very small state. Mm -hmm. Oregon, I think, has like. I actually don't know the numbers exactly. I would have to look them up, but I know they have at least four or five times the amount of dispensaries as California does, which is wow. ridiculous because we're a huge state. Yeah, it we, really with is. hardly any. Right. So you know, and that is part of that is just the way that policy rolled out, and we weren't 
active enough at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another part of that is, you know, farmers are like, well, we don't have time. How do we get out there? How do we get to a lobby day, especially in a big state like California? Right. Sacramento right. is a four hour drive. Right. That's a lobby day is easily two or three days of your time. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times it's in awkward situation or awkward timing right. where you're like, we're in the middle of spring, we're in the middle of harvest, I can't get away right now. Or I've got kids and I've got stuff and Lots I've got a kids. life and I've got a business. And so I've how got... do we do this? Right. And one of the things we found that's been incredibly effective in California and especially in Humboldt is putting some money into a political action committee. Okay. They're called PACs, P-A-C's. Mm -hmm. um, here in Massachusetts and all over the New England coast, there is um, a, a community called NOFA. NOFA <laughs> has chapters in you know a bunch of different states. There's NOFA Mass. They actually came to our event and had microscopes, and we got to talk about soil science and things. And they have an arm that is policy. So if you join an organization, it gives them more members, uh -huh. and then they can go through and say like, hey, you know, we now represent. 1,500 farmers, 3,000 farmers. We now represent 10,000 farmers. We now represent three quarters of the farmers in our state. Yeah. Okay, regulators listen to that. Right. If you're standing alone, beating your drum at the top of the mountain and shouting your truth, some people might hear, you might inspire others to join, but really you need somebody who that is their job. We go in and we represent you and we talk with your voice. Yes. Without that, it's, it's a really difficult thing to, right. to kind of, it's a difficult challenge to get across. And you end up with, Oversupply, under distributed, you know, under retailed, over regulations, over taxation. You just, it becomes very messy very quickly and it's really hard to redo a regulation. It is hard to pull things back. Right. You've lived it, you know, and that's the most important thing. And I think the piece that I'm going to impress upon our listeners and our viewers the, the most is that you have lived this life of truly fighting for farming fighting yeah. for the, the farming and the crop that you and your family choose to farm and it's 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 really it's quite remarkable what you have accomplished with five kids as a mom <laughs> okay can we talk about that how the hell do you do it all uh, um, Wendy <laughs> well so the five have only been this last year before okay. that there was two which was a little easier to manage but, but still, still I have one and I'm like dude it's a lot of work being, yeah. being a mom is a lot of work I am extremely blessed that my mom is a member of our team okay. so she helps with the farming she helps with the sales calls she helps with the accounting and the bookkeeping and she especially helps with the kids and the kids love her so it's like you know they'll go to school when school's in session and then they go to her house after school so that we can continue to work on the farm and then we pick them up and take them home for dinner and um you know, one of the, the hardest things about being a mom, and again, this comes back into this policy thing, is like we would, you know, buy a trailer or something to go put on our farm so we could all kind of live. We lived in tents last summer, so we had like the kids' tent and the adults' tent. And uh, at the beginning, everybody was like, yay! And, yeah. you know, by about week five, the kids were like, oh, we're so tired of camping. <laughs> but, um, You're like, you will look back <laughs> on this. But Very fondly. <laughs> and they will. And the they cool will. thing with that is that we still got to have family time. So, yeah. you know, California being this big state and having these, these wonky regulations sometimes makes it so that if you can't live on your farm, like how do you balance family time and farm time? Yeah. And, uh, and again, just blessed to have my mom be she there to, to help us pick up that slack. Because you're so. talking about family time and farm time, and a lot of people don't really grasp the concept of when the sun is up, as a farmer, you are up. When the sun is, is lowering in the sky, you are still working. We're, at that it's, point, it's usually more like, oh shoot, we didn't plan dinner. <laughs> <laughs> like, damn it, the humans have to eat, yeah. but the plants are good. Right, um, well, the, the beauty of that too is like, there's a lot of self-sufficiency that kids learn. Yes. Like, it's something with farm kids that I've seen that, that seems to be a missing component in children that grow up with a very stringent city life, is like, our kids are like, oh, well, there's nothing to, you know, you're not cooking me food right now. I guess I'll go forage in the garden. I guess I'll go scrounge through the pantry. I'll, you know. Yeah. And um, they figure it out. And it, yeah. it, it, some people like it sounds a little bit dismissive about your children. And I'm like, no, because I have amazing kids. I like, raised some really self-sufficient little critters. We have some <laughs> really, we've got little tiny human beings that are just phenomenal. I mean, yeah. people are constantly like, your kids are so cool. And I'm like, I never treated them like babies. I've always treated them like humans. And I've always mm. been like, you can do this yourself. I don't need to do that for you. Mm. I'm here to help at any time. I love you deeply and greatly. Mm. But um, mm. I think people 
I mean, sounds harsh, but I think people baby their babies way too much. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, I completely, I completely agree. I'm, I'm probably, um, probably guilty. I'm very guilty of that. I'm sure. Well, but that's, I have a co-parenting situation. Yeah. So when I have her, I'm just like, no, I'm gonna baby you. Yeah. And then you know, she's with her dad the next week and gets to, you know, you get, you get how that goes. And there's, and there's, you know, like, this is like, you know, what I talk about with farming. I'm like, listen, what works on my farm might not work on your farm. What works in my family might not work in your family. Right. It works for us. We're all happy. We're all healthy. We're all doing well. And right. my farm is definitely like, I, I joke around about it's a survive or die farm because we have a lot of square footage and we do every year we're planting more vegetables and we're planting more things alongside the cannabis and the light deprivation and the kids and everything else. And I'm like, you know, people are like, what if this plant doesn't survive? I'm like, well, it doesn't survive. What if this cultivar doesn't do well? Then I don't grow it again. Yeah, mm, it's a pretty easy answer. <laughs> what if your children didn't get lunch? They'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> they won't starve. They pretty won't starve. Sure, There's tons of food. They just may have to like not have something cooked right then. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, oh my God, incredible. So. So I have so many, so many questions. I know that we are here at the event and we've got to get back into it, but I do want to ask you, what, what words of advice do you have for women who might be intimidated about growing? I mean, there are so many women who look at your lifestyle and just, it's a dream. It's a dream to have what you have. And certainly it's not without its hard work, mm -hmm. but it's so intimidating to even think about transitioning into homesteading. So what, what words of what encouragement do you have for them? I love that you're asking this question because this was one thing that I wanted to address when I was on my talk and I totally forgot to do it. Um, it is really intimidating. Like I've done a lot of these conferences, I've done a lot of education, I've done a lot of workshops and the number of women is always a minority. Always, always, always. There's been a few things where I'm like, ooh, we're like 60-40, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but you know, it is something that women just have to be a little bit more courageous. You just have to step out. I've gotten really used to being the only female at the table. Right. Really used to it. Right. To the point where there's, when there's other women there, I'm like, oh, this is really exciting. There's like Yay. three of us. Yay. And that's another good point. You know, um, I think also outsider's perspective, looking in potentially, it's like, whoa, this is a, this is an OG cannabis cultivators club life. I don't fit in it and it's yeah. mostly dudes, but then there are some badass women and yeah. I certainly don't fit in next to them. You know, again, <laughs> yes, you do. I'm, but that's what I'm saying though. <laughs> yes, you do. And not, not just you, but like ladies, you do. You just yeah. have to get out and just like, I talk about it a lot. I'm like, you just have to claim your seat at the table. You have to say, I belong here. And it, it took me a minute to like start feeling comfortable reaching out. Now I'm totally comfortable. If I want to go something or I want to do something or want to be included, I just be like, hey, I should be there. Yeah. I should be at this thing that you're doing. I want to come. How can I, how can I be there? Yeah. And um, it was uh, the, actually it was the Gangier Council when that was happening. I, the, when they first were building it, um, I think that Patrick King and Omar Figueroa both posted. They weren't supposed to be posting yet because it was a secret project for the first year and a half, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, they posted something on social media and they were like, oh, we're going down and here's these people. And I was like, I should be there. Like, I want to be a part of that thing. And yes. I reached out to Pat and I was like, oh man, I don't know what you're doing, but like, I want to be there. And it wasn't even him. It was actually Derek Gilman, the program director, who realized there was a gap in what they were doing. But because I had been so forward with my knowledge and with sharing and with everything that I do, when he's like, ooh, we have a gap in this part of the program, he called me and was like, would you be willing to fill this gap? And I'm like, this is the thing I wanted to do. Oh, you know, I love I it. I put Don't it to the it. universe, I put it to the people, and then it just ended up flowing that way. Yes. And I, that's, that's a huge part of it. You just put it out there. Be courageous. Know that what you have has value. And oh my God, ladies, stop apologizing for your knowledge and your expertise, please. I, there was a oh my God. extreme turning point in all of this when I was saying I was going off about something for a while and I'm like, ah, but you know, I don't really know what I'm talking about. And then the next woman who was talking, she was talking about packaging and design. And she wasn't a package designer. It was like her hobby or whatever. It's her side hustle. She went off for like five minutes about whatever it was. And I'm like, this is amazing. This woman is fascinating. She has so much knowledge. Oh my gosh. Like, I don't know much about packaging. This is fantastic information and at the end of it she went but you know I don't really know what I'm talking about like this isn't really my thing and all of a sudden I was like how often do we do that 
Right. How often do we excuse our expertise by saying, but I don't really know what I'm doing about because I'm not getting paid 125,000 a year to do this, this thing Ugh. that I'm passionate about and that I'm knowledge about, right. you know? And the I'm sorry thing, like, mm. oh, well, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. I'm like, I don't even do that anymore. I'm like, oh, I totally disagree with you. Yeah. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. No. You know, no. I have yeah. dissenting opinions and I'm proud of those. Right. I'm not going to agree with everybody all the time. Everybody's not agree with me all the time. And that's how we learn. Yeah. And that's how we cultivate even more sophisticated um, ideas and methodologies. And it's how we come together. Yes. Yes. It's in how the we name see other viewpoints. Yes. I've had a lot of things changed because I was like, no, I, this is my opinion. And then having these amazing discourses with other people, mm -hmm. having them listen to me, me listening to them, mm -hmm. not taking things personally, not getting e egotistical about it, right. but just being like, we have differing opinions. Yeah. You know, we've seen that on the panel last night. Yeah. You know, Patrick and, and Dan yeah. Kittrich were just like, no, I don't agree. No, I don't agree. No, I don't agree. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm not going to smoke your fermented weed that you put in a cone cob. I don't care how good fermentation is for us. <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> and I'm not going to apologize for it. No. I hope I don't offend people, but sometimes we just do. Just more for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, but I love it. That, you know, that point of women just apologizing for the space yeah. that we take the knowledge that we have, the time that we have, you know, feeling like a burden. I mean, it's, and you know, it's giving up the space theme. without, without even like looking on the outside and being like, oh, that's so cool. I would love to do that. Do yeah. it. Follow your passion. Yeah. Like money will follow. There may be hard times, but it doesn't really matter because when the money gets tight, if the passion is still there, you're still happy. You're still doing, you know, what you want to do. I know it's easy to say sometimes when people are like, well, look at you, you're making tons of money. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> no, no, no. California cannabis is not really that profitable anymore. Uh, but, yeah. you know, like I said, we lived in tents. It was great. You know, yeah. even the kids, I know. Because you had your passion. Three years from now, the kids are going to be like, man, remember that summer when we lived in tents on the farm? Oh, it was yeah. awesome. Man, my parents <laughs> are so cool. Totally. Um, I, God, I love that so much. You, I bet you have so many just incredible stories and insights into just, you know, how policy and lawmakers and governments can come in and really fuck stuff up yeah um it's brutal so, the people yeah. who are, are actual the lobbyists and things i'm like oh more power to yeah, you god I bless them we're really working hard you know certainly to build um build our numbers in texas for you know cannabis and and home grow and just freedom yeah. freedom for you know farming in general um and so we have a lot to learn and i'm just i really feel grateful to have you as a friend to call you and ask you about certain thoughts and when certain bills are written and yeah. you know um, just having that insight because we do have some great lobbyists in the state but we need that that outside perspective yeah. that perspective from somebody who's lived it like you may think this is a good deal and you may want to keep your you know keep your opinions to yourself just to get this bill through right because it's a step in the right direction right but you're no. gonna be the one who's gonna be like Liz don't do it yeah don't do it. You know, and, and that is, it's the truth and your truth and your unapologetic truth is why I'm just like so, God, I just feel so blessed to have you, have you well, in orbit. I'm really excited to yeah, have advocates like you out there that are doing this work because it is incredibly important. Thank you. And yeah. you know, even here in Massachusetts, there's advocates that are just like, oh, they look at California and they're like, look at how good California's doing because they're looking at the tax dollars that have come in, but right. they're not looking at the longevity of the industry. Right. And when an industry right. undermines itself by overtaxation, you don't have an industry left anymore, which means those tax dollars drop to zero. Yeah. So there's a way that this can be, you know, there's a way that things can be flowing correctly in the right ways mm -hmm. that support the right companies. And I think that a lot of that is, you know, really driven by the younger people today. Like yeah. they have a different viewpoint. So we, we're still fighting against the older policymakers mm -hmm. that aren't seeing that. But we have a lot of push with the millennials that are like, this is important. Regenerative farming is important. Our environment is screwed because of what you guys did before. Yes. Now you need to fix it. Yes. But they are relying on us to be able to understand those bills because no offense to the millennials, but y'all don't like to read the bills. It's not even millennials, <laughs> actually. I'm going to take that back. It's I mean, everybody. it's youth, right? I mean, it's well, when you look at it. Older it's, people. Yeah, like it's Gen know, X, baby boomers. Nobody likes, nobody to read, likes to read the bills. Nobody likes to read the bills. I get it. Do it anyway. They're horrible to get through, but they're important. Yeah. Prop 64, when it was coming through, I think it was 12 pages or something, and I, I must have read that at least a dozen times, if not more, until I really understood it. Mm. And when I really understood it, I realized how bad Proposition 64 was for California. Right. I was like, this is not good. And everybody's like, it's a step in the right direction. I said, it's vague. 
a vague bill is worse than a bad bill because a vague bill puts all the power in the hands of the policymakers, yes. and they get to determine how to enact things, mm. how to enforce them, mm. what you get to do. Do you get to do home grow in Texas outside, or are we going to make you be in a limited six plant indoor? Mm. Because a six plant indoor is not going to get you very much. I hadn't even thought of that. I shit you not. If we saw a bill today that said, "Yay, six plants, home grow," you got it. You'd oh be my all God, about it, right? Texans would be so excited. And right. then we learn that we have to do it in our own closets. Yep. Because. Wow, okay, good. It's, it's, it's just, really important yeah. to think about those little right. tiny niggly details of right. like, if they don't say anything, they can then say, we're gonna enact it this yeah. way. They, We've they, decided it is, we, we still think it's a dangerous plant, obviously, because we're not letting you do it at all. Yeah. So now we're gonna protect everybody from these dangerous plants by locking them behind closed doors where they're nice and safe. No, no, And it's no, no, a no. horrible way to grow things. Anybody who's had a hydroponic tomato knows that, like, this is not where flavor comes from. No. Uh, you know, sure. They can it? sustain us. I feel like hydroponics. Ish. Right, <laughs> ish, exactly. I mean, I feel like hydroponics definitely have, they certainly have their place. Oh, for in sure. In the ecosystem. And but I feel like it's when Armageddon comes. Right. And we know what I mean, we're right. topsoil. And it's, and it's important. It is, it important, is important to know how to grow things without dirt. Yes. I, I see the validity in it. And some... Cultivators I, can really do some amazing can. things without dirt. I'm, it's I'm mind blowing. Sometimes. I've had some amazing hydroponic that I'm like, wow, this is actually pretty tasty. Right. I still think soil grown, sun grown is better. Yes. Um, and you know, a lot of times it takes a blind tasting to get there. But again, if you're in a state where they have said you have to be in an industrial complex on concrete, you know, hydroponic might be your go-to, and, and right. maybe you crush it at that, and I have no problems with that. Right, right. right. But I'm always challenging people to think the step beyond. Yeah. So if you're going to do hydroponics, like, think about how to do it more naturally. Mm. It's the, only, the only issue I take with hydroponics is that the fertilizer regimen is always salt-based chemicals. And, you know, or chemical-based salts, I should say. Um, and it's not necessarily that that's the worst thing in the world for the plant, and it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world for the water, but the way that they're produced, the way that they're manufactured, the places that do this work, the way their workers are treated, all of this starts to impact, or should start to impact, the way we think about things and the choices that we make in our lives. Absolutely. How do we choose to spend our money? Absolutely. What companies do we choose to support, and what kind of things do they support? Mm. So oh my God, amen. this all kind of plays into, you know, my, 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 my own personal paradigm that we should be growing things where they grow, which is outside in the dirt. Absolutely. So how do people find you, son of us? I mean, tell us every way we can find you oh gosh. and find your product and support you and your family and your, your so those ways. We're, we're online at www.sunnabus.com. Um, it's Sun Grown Cannabis, Sunnabus. Um, which we do have a federal trademark on. I think we were one of the first companies to get a federal trademark because we were trying to get one for cannabis. We had a California cannabis trademark and our lawyer was like, do you want to go for a federal one? We're like, sure, why not? They're like, you're not going to get it. There's no trademarks for weed yet. And we're like, oh, well, whatever. They were like, it'll put a baseline in though. It's a great name. And um, total tangent story. I love um, it. So we went for it anyway, and it was seriously, they denied us. And two days later, the 2018 Farm Bill passed with hemp. Oh. And they were like, oh my gosh, we're going to amend it and say hemp, and you should be in. <gasps> and we were like, great, let's do it. That's incredible. So, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's massive. So you have a federal trademark on that name. And yep. you know what we're talking about now, how can you help out the small craft farmer? Yeah. It's um, a lot of the advice was let's help the small craft farmer to help themselves through their branding and their marketing and their ability to tell their own story. And what you have with Sunnabus is all of that and then you've protected that on a federal level. Yeah. So when we do, when we when we open up interstate trade, we'll be able to get Sunnabus in Texas, baby. Yeah. Bring that Sunnabus down to I'm, Texas. I'm excited. Grow like, some Sunnabus down in Texas. Texas has amazing Texas sunlight, it's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, come and teach us. Yeah. Come and teach us the regenerative ways. I mean, when you told me about the difference between the beds and pots and, and you know 10 to 30 percent more just better yield yep and and all of the benefits to not just financially but to environmentally and all that I mean it's just we can talk forever and I just want to continue to do that I Absolutely. really do I, I really, I'm, I'm really excited to get to know you better yeah. and to be a part of this movement because it's it's huge and we we can't tell the story all by ourselves we really yeah. rely on other people to help get the word out so 
I'm really grateful to you for, for taking time with us and for coming all the way here from Texas and being a part of this conference. It's, it's massive to us. So. Oh, uh, and let's hear it. You find me so online. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very active on Instagram. Okay. So that's where I do a lot of my like, you oh, know, good. kind of educational stuff. Like I have a lot of posts about what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. Good. Um, okay. Organic Cultivators has a YouTube channel. So a lot of this okay. conference is going to go up on that channel for people that couldn't make it. That's mm -hmm. going to be free content. Um, we're gonna, I think I'm gonna try and pop in on the workshop with, um, PC, with Pro Cannabis Media that's gonna be happening. Yes, on the so 23rd. that first workshop is yeah. gonna be a free workshop, if I'm understanding correctly, you just have to register for it. Right, yeah. Um, so there'll be some, you know, some question and answer type stuff going on there. Yeah. And uh, I do have a tweet, a tweeter, see? <laughs> right. I, I have one of those accounts. I don't really, I'm not very active on that. I, I do have LinkedIn. I'm not really active on that. Um, okay. Really Instagram and then direct messaging um, or, or emailing is a great way. Awesome. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I know your story has, I mean, it's inspired me incredibly and it'll inspire so many others. And um, I just, I can't wait to visit your farm. Yes. I'm really, really kind of inviting myself. Come um, visit. It's just, see, and that's what we mean. If you want it. something, we, ask for it. Yes, I really would love to. You just ask for it anytime. Oh, and we'll anytime. be well behaved. Um, oh, but, no, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> Good, perfect. The minute I said that, I'm like, wait a minute, that was a lie. <laughs> but you know what? This is Wendy. I can, you can't get anything past Wendy Kornberg. Uh, seriously, I, it, I can't say it enough what an honor it is just to be hanging with you, Wendy. And thank you for opening up your mind and your heart to yeah. us and all of this. So. Let's go back to the conference. Love it. So thank you. You're incredible. If you'd like more, subscribe to the Feminized Podcast on YouTube. Follow at Feminized with Liz Grow on Instagram. Special thanks to our sponsors, Moose Labs and Richard's Rainwater. The Feminized Podcast is a Grow House Media production created by Liz Grow, produced by Patrick Pope and Dennis Ray, with original theme music and audio mixing by Q at Q to King Productions in New Braunfels, Texas. <laughs>